welcome to everybody that signed on to today's webinar. My name is John Paul Ruiz, Director of Professional Development here at the Entrust Group. Thank you again for attending the Transfers versus Rollovers, Which One is Right for You webinar. Uh, the Entrust Group, before we get started, uh, it has a focus on education uh, for our clientele. Not to give advice, but just to provide enough information so that the consumer uh, hopefully will have enough information uh, to be able to make an informed decision. Again, there's a disclaimer in this webinar that it's purely for education. Entrust does not provide investment advice or endorse any products. Again, all information and materials are for educational purposes only. All parties are encouraged to consult with their attorney, accountants, and financial advisors before entering into any type of investment. Now that we've got that uh, out of the way, the agenda for today's course, uh, first, we're going to talk a little bit about Entrust for those of you who are attending our seminars for the first time. We're also going to talk about the benefits of self-direction. For a lot of people who are attending, you may or may not know already, the, the focus of the Entrust group is for what we call self-directed retirement plans, and we'll explain what that means. We'll also take a look at some of the common investment options available uh, in uh, out there that's typically not available in other IRA providers' uh, platforms. But now, diving into the main focus of the seminar, given the fact that one of the main um, reasons or one of the main uh, funding mechanisms for an IRA is not only making contributions to it, but also moving assets from other types of IRAs of the same type to another financial institution. And what that means is that individuals who have contributed to their retirement plan sometimes try to avail of a different type of investment, which means that they may have to move their assets from one institution to another. There are two ways to move assets uh, of the same or assets from an IRA or retirement plan of the same type to other organizations, and that is your transfer and rollover. Now, a lot of people attending this course may say, what's the difference between a transfer and a rollover? Well, there is a big difference between the two. And what we're going to try to do in the seminar is to give you some information or education in regards to the retirement plan lingo so that as you conduct your transactions between financial institutions, that we are speaking the same language so that, number one, it doesn't cause errors between financial institutions, and number two, it doesn't cause us some uh, red flags from the IRS uh, given the fact that some of these transactions may not be reportable and the other type of transactions may be reportable. If those two don't match, then it could cause some red, unnecessary, unintended consequences, such as red flags from the IRS. Again, we're going to focus mainly on the two ways to move assets. Um, out of the four different ways to move assets, we're going to focus on two of them, transfers and rollovers. Given the fact that we are cl also close to uh, tax return due date time, we'll also talk uh, briefly about the contribution eligibility requirements as well as the limits um, for 2017, given the fact that the, the deadline to make a contribution to an IRA is, is coming up here, which is a tax return due date of an individual, not including extensions. Lastly, we'll take a look at you know, how, to, how to establish a self-directed IRA account, and then we're going to open up the phone lines for any questions you may have in regards to the materials presented. Now, the Entrust Group has been around for over 36 years, focusing mainly on what we call self-direction. In other words, we are an administrator of self-directed retirement plans. Unlike other IRA providers that actually offer an investment, and that's what they sell, is basically having an IRA at their institution to avail of their investments. If you're at a bank, uh, CDs, money market accounts, savings accounts, if you are a broker-dealer, then you have securities, mutual funds, stocks, bonds, but the interest group is slightly different. We're, we are an administrator. In other words, we administer retirement plans but do not offer investments. What's the beauty about self-direction? The beauty about it is that you, the IRA or the retirement um, uh, owner, can actually choose whatever investment you would like to hold under that IRA to be held in custody on your behalf. In other words, you have the open ocean of investments available to you, of course, assuming that it's allowable under law. Given the fact that there are only three different types of investments that's not allowed on the, under an IRA, such as your life insurance contracts, collectibles, and last but not least, S-Corps. Now, it's not as simple as that. There are rules around uh, you know, purchasing uh, certain types of investments to so make sure that you do not engage in a prohibited transaction. But generally, 
the OSHA of investments out there are pretty broad. And depending upon the financial institution that you deal with, they might uh, offer a limited uh, selection of investments. But with a self-directed retirement plan uh, administrator, you, the IRA holder, has more flexibility in choosing the type of investment that you wish to hold under your retirement plan. I briefly mentioned custody. What does that mean? Retirement plans are, are tax deferred. In other words, you don't get tax on the earnings while it's sitting under the umbrella of a retirement plan. In other words, when you open up uh, an IRA at the interest group and you fund it by moving assets from existing uh, retirement plans of the same type, traditional to traditional, Roth to Roth is an example, or simple IRA to simple IRA, when you move it to us, it, re it remains under the umbrella of what we call a tax-deferred account. And in this case, a traditional IRA, a Roth IRA, a simple IRA, or a SEP IRA. As long as it remains under the umbrella of such uh, an account, a retirement account, the earnings grow tax deferred. In other words, the earnings do not get taxed until you take a distribution. That's why a custodian is necessary in this particular type of uh, uh, arrangement. Now, that's what we perform. That's the, that's the services we provide by establishing an IRA at the interest group and funding it from a uh, retirement plan from another financial institution of the same type to us. Now you have the option to direct us to invest in um, whatever investment you choose, as long as it's allowable under law. We have been in a leader in the industry for 30, over 36 years. We've been around for a while. Uh, we process around 12,000 to 16,000 client transactions every month. And uh, in our portfolio, there's around 3.2 billion in investor assets. Now, how, how do we stay competitive in the field? Uh, as a provider of self-directed retirement plans, not only do we uh, administer, we also educate, which is, separates us from the rest. We have knowledgeable staff, uh, most of who, uh, most of which have what we call the CISP designation through the American Banking Association. The CISP designation is a certified IRA services professional, um, which is a designation, again, through the, the Institute of Certified Bankers, American Banking Association. We provide national CE programs for other designations. It's a CFP board. We're an approved continuing education provider for the IRS, uh, NASBA, as well as um, uh, other continuing education uh, requirements, for example, real estate agents, so on and so forth. We provide these education opportunities uh, nationally and locally in person in some cases as long as it's uh, cost uh, effective. And last but not least, we do have an IRA school. Uh, it's called the IRA Academy, which is a preparatory course for individuals interested in what we call the CISP designation. So not only do we educate our own staff, but we also educate uh, other staff members in the industry. Now let's quickly take a look at self-direction. I hope you don't mind. I'm kind of going through this fairly quickly so that I can dive into the material, uh, which is why a lot of you are attending this course. What's the benefit of self-direction? If you have an administrator that doesn't offer investment but allows you, the um, IRA holder, to choose the investment of, of your liking to hold in your retirement plan, that gives you um, more investment choices. In other words, you can take control of where you would like to invest your hard-earned retirement plan assets. Given the fact that we can hold a broader array of investment, I, as, you, as you notice, I'm careful with my words, we don't operate investments, we hold it on your behalf. Diversification these days is one of the main tools in leveraging um, against uh, market fluctuations in certain sectors of investing, such as the stock market. Right now, the stock market has... has gone down, gone up, gone down. Well, if you don't want to invest in a stock market, you have other options. You can invest in many different types of assets and also invest in what you know and understand. A lot of our clients, um, one, of, one of the most popular investments individuals invest in in the self-directed world is, a piece, is, is real estate. You know, whereas some, some uh, IRA providers will not hold real estate because they're not set up for it, we will. Tax savings contributions may be deductible in these retirement accounts, as well as, last but not least, as long as it remains under the umbrella of a retirement plan, the earnings do grow tax deferred. And in some cases, depending upon the IRA that you have, the earnings will eventually be distributed tax-free. And what I mean by that is you either have a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA. 
Now, here are some of the common investments that a lot of a lot of our uh, clientele or clientele that we have serviced currently or in the past uh, hold in their in their retirement plans: single family and multi unit homes, commercial properties, improved or unimproved land, precious metals. The Small Business Job Protection Act of 1996 allows for certain types of precious metals to be held under a retirement plan. They may invest in um, uh, businesses such as limited liability companies, offshore real estate, as long as, of course, there is, it's set up correctly um, in a way that it can still be held under um, the IRA. Apartment buildings, co-ops, and condominiums, notes, and other types of investments uh, out there. Again, there are only three different types of investments that are prohibited from being held under uh, an IRA. According to law, there's two, but with an additional one because of its characteristic. Uh, those are collectibles. Collectibles means any artwork, rug, antique, um, some metals or gems. And metals, of course, qualified uh, because there are some precious metals that can be held under an IRA. But if it doesn't meet the qualifications set forth under the U.S. tax code, well, that metal may not be eligible to be held under an IRA or retirement plan. Stamp or coin collection, alcoholic beverage collection, just to name a few of those types of collectibles that cannot be held under a retirement plan. Life insurance contracts, meaning endowment contracts. Uh, mainly, as an example, term life insurance cannot be held under an IRA. There are IRAs and insurance companies called annuities. We cannot hold those because annuities can only be held by an insurance company. Last but not least, um, S-Corps. Uh, IRAs cannot invest in S-Corps because there's a revenue ruling in 1979 that says an IRA is, number one, a trust, of course, and a trust cannot be a shareholder of an S-Corp. Now that you know the investment restrictions, well, it opens up the world for investing. Why is that? Because besides those three, you can actually have invest in any, uh, just about anything out there as long as who you engage with is not what we call a disqualified person. In other words, there are prohibited transaction rules involved for conflicts of interest. In other words, you can't invest in your own company under an IRA that you own and control because that, that leaves room for um, potential abuses and conflict of interest. That's why that has been written into the code. But nonetheless, the entity itself, is in, some entities are not prohibited from uh, being invested in with using retirement plan assets. It so happens that there, if there's any conflict of interest, um, it may be prohibited. But moving on, the purpose of this particular course is to talk about uh, two of the four ways to move assets in the retirement plan space. Why are we talking about that? Because most of our um, clientele basically move assets around to different institutions. Why is that? because they're trying to avail of a different investment that may be best for them at that time. Understanding the terminology in the, in the retirement industry would not only uh, facilitate the process easier, uh, also understanding the nuances of the differences between the two would make it a lot, um, you know, a lot, a lot um, I would say, uh, more efficient. And last but not least, hopefully will not cost tax consequences by by understanding the different terminology when you request to, pro to conduct a transaction uh, with one institution interacting with another. Starting off with what we call a transfer. A transfer is tossed around in the industry as a way to move assets from like plans. When I say like plans, it's IRA to IRA, Roth to Roth, simple to simple, with one exception. A simple IRA can actually move to a traditional IRA as long as a two-year rule has been satisfied. What does that mean? From the initial date of contribution, two years has passed. Once that is satisfied, a simple IRA can actually be transferred to a traditional IRA. Why is that important? Because some people may have a traditional IRA, and they may also have an employer-sponsored plan called a simple IRA that requires a simple IRA to be established to receive the contributions. Now, for some, you would hold two accounts, but some people may ask, well, can I transfer that simple to traditional? The answer is, only after that two-year rule has been satisfied. Now, uh, transfers are not reported to the IRS. As a matter of fact, the IRS says, if I can't tax anybody because you're just moving it from one financial institution to the other, save the paperwork. So it does require a little bit of due diligence for two financial institutions to make sure that, number one, the, the access to the dollars uh, is never made available to the IRA holder. 
In other words, if you start thinking about it, if money is going to go from one financial institution to the other, number one, the check should never be made payable to the IRA holder. Therefore, the check must always be made payable to the receiving IRA at the receiving institution. In our case, as an example, a naming convention would be the interest group for the benefit of uh, John Doe, uh, traditional IRA, and account number. Why is that important? To make sure that the name uh, is identifiable so that the money goes into the correct IRA. In some cases, uh, individuals may have multiple IRAs of the same type. Why is that? Because they may have named different beneficiaries in each one of those IRAs, or they want to keep those IRAs separate uh, for one reason or another. By putting identification, uh, uh, certain naming conventions on the identification of the payee on a check in the event of a transfer, the sending institution um, needs to put in as much information so that the receiving institution would know who and where to credit that uh, transfer of assets. Uh, transfers, again, are not reportable. Therefore, there will not be a 1099-R issued. A 1099-R, for a lot of people who do not know, it's miscellaneous income that's coming from a retirement plan. Retirement plan distributions are not only subject to tax, may also be subject to a penalty. Therefore, the IRS created its own 1099, 1099 form. 1099 reports income to an individual. As an example, if you have a, a savings account that's taxable in a bank, then it'd be a 1099-INT as an example, 1099 interest, or 1099-DIV DIV for dividends. But in the, in, in the IRA world, if you take a distribution, which a transfer is not, a distribution is reportable. If you take money out, again, that has to be reported to Uncle Sam. A transfer is non-reportable. It is also non-taxable. And as a recap, Again, you can do a transfer between traditional to traditional, Roth to Roth, a simple to simple, or a SEP to SEP. As long as a two-year rule has been satisfied, a simple can be transferred to a traditional IRA. Now, unlike the next transaction, in a transfer, there are you can do as many of those as you want. You can go from ABC Financial Institution as an example. I'm just using uh, hypothetical names to XYZ Company today. Tomorrow, you can do it again. The following day, you can do it again. You can do as many transfers as you want. The, another transaction we'll cover later on, a rollover, there is a restriction, but focusing on transfers. When you contact your current custodian to transfer retirement fr funds into a self-directed IRA, be sure to ask the right questions. Does my current custodian require the original transfer form, or would a photocopy or a scanned copy be okay? Do they need to mail the form or a fax? Because keep in mind, when you're dealing with a transfer, you're going, to dealing, you're going to be dealing not only with the regulatory requirements, you may be dealing with policies that may be different from financial institution to financial institution. As an example of the difference, if you are going to be dealing with, let's say, a mutual fund company, which is uh, governed by FINRA. Uh, FINRA is a non-governmental regulatory body that governs securities uh, or, or uh, financial institutions that deal with securities. If, you're, if the signature needs to be authenticated, they will not uh, take, accept, uh, um, uh, slips my mind right now, a notary. They will require a medallion guarantee. Now, keep in mind, again, that's not a regulatory piece. It's a policy based on a regulatory agency that's governing the investment that you're dealing with or investment provider you're dealing with. If you ask, do they need a medallion or would, they, would a photocopy work? Do, uh, do they have the dollar amount you're transferring? In some cases, you may be just be transferring a portion. You may also even be transferring in kind. In other words, you're transferring property. Those are the types of nuances that you need to be aware of when conducting a transfer. If you're transferring cash, make sure that uh, the amount requested is liquidated and made available. If you're going to move from a mutual fund company to the interest group as an example, um, we cannot accept mutual funds because although, you know, you can have a broad array of investments, we, we don't have a way of holding mutual funds, you may have to liquidate cash. So those are the nuances uh, that one might think about when you are transferring from one institution to another. Now, another type of transaction, on, in, in, which is a way to move assets from one financial institution to another, is a rollover. A rollover is very different, again, from like plan. A rollover is a two-part transaction. 
A rollover is initially uh, a distribution. In other words, somebody requesting money to come out. If you recall again, unless your assets uh, leave the plant, it doesn't get taxed. But when it leaves the plant, it could get taxed. The reason why I say it could is because of this thing called a rollover. If you take money out of a plan, the custodian will issue a 1099-R. In other words, it's going to be reported to Uncle Sam that you took money out. Now, if the individual decides that, you know, I, I, do, I really don't want to get taxed on this money, well, you can actually put it back. Uncle Sam says if you put it back, you have to put it back within 60 days. 60 days start when? 60 days start from the day after you received the funds. See, in other words, see, it's not the date of the check. It's actually when you receive the funds. So when you receive the funds, if the custodian mails you a check, well, it starts day one starts the day after you receive that check. So what's the moral of the story? Keep good records. If you take money out and you wanted to put it back, you have 60 days to put it back. However, uh, there are nuances in a rollover if you want to put it back. If you're going to put it back, you can only put it back in the same type of IRA. It doesn't have to be in the same financial institution, but it has to be the same type. Traditional to traditional, Roth to Roth, simple to simple, again, with one exception. If you have a simple IRA that has satisfied the two-year rule again, meaning that a contrib once a contribution is made, two years has passed, those can be rolled into a traditional. A rollover is simple. You request a distribution from retirement plan. You receive a check from the current provider made payable to you in this case. And the best way to cash that check is you deposit it. So most of the time when you're putting money back, it's coming from your own checking account. Uh, if it's coming from your checking account and you want to roll that back, don't be surprised if questions are asked uh, by the receiving institution. Why is that? Because they need to make sure that those assets are eligible to come back. They would ask significant questions such as, has it been more than 60 days? They will also ask questions such as, if this is a simple IRA, has more than two years passed. Um, if uh, another question could be, is there any portion of these assets, if you're over 17 and a half, a part of your required minimum distribution? And next, we haven't talked about this rule yet, but have you done more than one of these in a 12-month period? You see, in a rollover, you're limited to one of these transactions in a rolling 12-month period. What does that mean? If you take a distribution on February 1st and you rolled that distribution back in within 60 days, you cannot take another distribution and roll it back in until February 1st of the following year. And when I, when I say one, the Treasury Department, in other words, the IRS who works for the Treasury, says that is in aggregate of all your IRAs. In other words, your traditional, your Roth, your SEP IRAs, and your simple IRAs, you can only do one of these rollovers for all of those types of IRAs once in a 12-month period. Now, what's the moral story here? If all you're trying to do is move from one financial institution to another, don't do it as a rollover. I would highly recommend to do it as a transfer because you can do an unlimited number of transfers uh, at any time. Right? Again, you have 60 days to deposit to check back into the new plan of the same type. The amount of the distribution will need to be reported on your tax return. However, if you roll over funds, they will not be taxable. Here's a good tip. If you ever, if you took a distribution and you roll it back in, there's line 15A and 15B on your IRS form 1040. The IRS 1040, 15A says, did you take any money out of your IRA? That's 15A. 15B says, any portion of this amount, is it taxable? And the answer would be, if you rolled it back in, no. Uncle Sam said, if you rolled it back in, right rollover beside line 15B. At that point, the IRS would not only look for the 1099-R for that distribution, they will also look for another IRS form. That IRS form is the IRS form 5498. In other words, you've got amount coming out. In our world, we call that a debit. The IRS form 5498 is a credit. But sometimes the IRS Form 5498 may not show up until subsequent tax years. But the IRS says it's okay as long as you put rollover beside line 15B for the amount that you put back in, then we'll wait for that 5498 once it comes out to start tallying or making sure that everything is, uh, everything is what you say happened. All right? So the rollover is not the end of the world. But again, you're limited to one of those in a 12-month period, a so rolling 12 months from the date of distribution 
can't do another one of those from for a rolling 12 months up until the following year. Uh, rolling funds will keep the assets tax deferred. It's like an oops transaction. I took money out. Oops, I didn't want to take it out. You can put it back in within 60 days. As you can see, there is a big difference between what we call a transfer and a rollover. Rollover tips. When you contact your custodian, let them know that you are going to make a withdrawal. Be sure to tell them the exact amount you're distributing, if not the entire amount. Consider a transfer if your goal is just to move your assets to another IRA. When you receive your check from a previous custodian, make sure to remit the check to the new custodian within 60 days by making a check payable to the custodian for the benefit of you and the type of IRA you have at the new custodian or the same custodian with your account number so that they know which IRA that those dollars that you're making, uh, that you're cutting a check to, is supposed to go into. Now, here's another type of rollover which has a distinct term associated with it. It's called a direct rollover. The direct rollover pertains to movement of assets from an employer-sponsored plan into an IRA. It's not an IRA to IRA of the same type. This is an employer-sponsored plan, such as your qualified retirement plans. The most common one out there is what we call the 401k plan. There's also your profit-sharing plans, your money purchase pension plans, target benefit plans, Defined benefit plans are you taking a lump sum distribution from. Those are what we call qualified retirement plans under Section 401A of the Internal Revenue Code. I'm slowing it down here because some of you might be writing this down. 401A of the Internal Revenue Code. If your employer is not, um, uh, not sure what type of plan they have, which I hope they are, ask them the question, is it subject to 401A? And they go, well, I don't know. You might want to take a look at your plan document. The plan document of the plan will tell the employer what section of the code the plan is covered under. But if it's just 401k, that's a given right there. That's a qualified retirement plan. Other types of employer-sponsored plans, such as your 403b, another term for that is a tax-deferred annuity, or a tax-sheltered annuity, common for um, nonprofit organizations that's, uh, that, that's established, uh, like a hospital that's nonprofit, or uh, teachers, uh, those types of entities um, have a retirement plan, but in this case, it's called a 403B. Now, lastly, some governmental entities has what we call a governmental 457B plan. Governmental 457B plan can move into an IRA, assuming, of course, that the individual uh, has what we call a distributable event in all cases for these types of plans. Employer-sponsored plan movements to IRAs are what we call a direct rollover. A direct rollover moves directly from the employer-sponsored plan to an IRA. Therefore, it looks like a transfer, but it's not. Why is that? Because they're non-like plans. If you formally participated in an employer-sponsored plan, not formally, meaning you've separated from service or terminated employment, uh, whether it be voluntary or involuntary, you've reached normal retirement age, uh, it may be in some cases a quadro, a qualified domestic relations order, in other words, a divorce. Or maybe the plan may be terminating. You have a distributable event. Those are just some examples of that. If you formally participated in an employer-sponsored plan, you may direct your previous employer to send your retirement funds directly to an IRA administrator, such as the Entrust Group, to fund your IRA. And from there, you can start investing. A direct rollover is different than a transfer, again, because it's it involves two different types of plans. Transfers only occur between like, sub, like types of plans, of course, with one exception. If you have a simple IRA, it has satisfied the two-year rule. It's not like a broken record. I keep saying that over and over again. Direct rollovers are also not subject to the 20% withholding for retirement plan distributions. Let me speak to this really quickly. If you have separated from service from an employer and they give you a notice or packet that says, here are your options, all right. One of the options in that packet, which is a fairly thick packet, the reason for that is so many disclosures required by law, or else the employer gets in trouble, but you hand that to an employee, how many people are going to read that? One of the things you might want to pay close attention to is that if you take a distribution from an employer-sponsored plan, like a 401k, 403b, governmental 457b plan, that employer is mandated to withhold, or in other words, set aside and send to the IRS 20% of that distribution. So in other words, if you want to take $100,000 out, well, your check is only going to be $80,000 if you request a distribution. 
the, that bullet point is talking about direct rollovers, stating that if you request a direct rollover from an employer-sponsored plan to an IRA, that 20% withholding does not come into play. The full 100000 in my example, will go from the employer-sponsored plan to the IRA. But if you request a distribution, well, guess what? You're not going to get the full amount. You're only going to get 80%. Be aware of that. Be careful with that because that could cause some grave tax consequences on your part because that 20% that does not go into that IRA is going to be includable as taxable income plus sub potentially subject to the 10% early distribution penalty if you're under the age of 59 and a half. So understanding the terminology can make a big difference on whether or not that 20% applies or that 20% does not apply. All right? Now that we've covered... Um, um, the two ways to move assets, transfers and rollovers, as well as an additional movement of assets between an employer and an IRA. Called direct rollover, since it's tax time, let's take a look at uh, some contribution basis, basics. Since transfers and rollovers are types of contributions, but we're going to focus mainly on the annual contribution. How much can you put in an IRA annually? Well, the annual contribution is a deposit of personal funds into an IRA in the form of cash. In other words, you cannot contribute to an IRA in a form of uh, property. It always has to be in cash. Some people still ask, though, can I write a check or wire, AC, that's cash. You can, as long as it's cash, you can make that contribution. The tax code limits the dollar amount you can contribute each year to each type of IRA. Contributions for the tax year 2017 must be postmarked on or before the 17th, or if you make it into a financial institution by April 17th uh, of the year, then it's still in a timely fashion. Now, typical deadline is April 15th. However, uh, for 2017 uh, tax year, uh, the deadline is April 17, 2018. Why is that? Because April 15th falls on a weekend or a holiday. And given the fact that D.C., which is the main office where the IRS is, celebrates Emancipation Day, then the following business day is the ultimate tax return deadline that puts, that puts us at April 17th. Once the contribution is made, your custodian will report and submit an IRS form 5498, 5498 as proof to the IRS that you actually made a contribution. Now let's take a look at the two different types of IRAs starting off with a traditional IRA. Who is eligible to contribute to a traditional IRA? There's only two requirements, folks. Two. First one is an age requirement. If somebody's going to turn 70 and a half at any time during a particular calendar year, in this case, if you turn 70 and a half in 2017, you are no longer eligible to contribute to a traditional IRA. But if you're not turning 70 and a half at any time during that year, you still may contribute. Now, another requirement is that you have to have taxable compensation. Another good definition for that is what we call earned income. There's a lot of people out there that have taxable compensation, but it's passive income. In other words, income that is not subject to Social Security tax. A good example or safe harbor example of uh, uh, earned income is W-2 wages. It's, in other words, it's wages received for services performed subject to Social Security tax. Uncle Sam says if you're not going to pay Social Security tax on that income, you can't use that for contribution purposes. In order for you to be able to to use that income to determine whether or not you're eligible to contribute is that you have to participate in the Social Security program for the income that you receive. Some passive income that is not considered as earned income is rental income, dividend income, interest income, pension income. Those are just some examples. But wages for services performed received under W-2 or 1099 are income filed as a sole proprietor as an example. Those are types of incomes, but it has to be positive the maximum contribution is lowered down by the level of your compensation. In other words, if the maximum for the year is 5500 well, if your income is only 2000 well, your, the maximum contribution for the year for you is 2000 Now, there's an additional $1,000 contribution that can be made if you attain age 50 before the end of your taxable year. That's a statutory limit. So in other words, a statutory limit it's 5500 if you're under the age of 50 and 6500 if you're 50 and over, as long, of course, that you have enough earned income to support that contribution. Another type of contribution that can be made is what we call a spousal contribution. Now, there are some cases where uh, you have a, you know, a couple, and one of them is working and the other one is not. The other one, although, works harder than the other one, but just don't get paid for it, right? 
Uh, I think you get, you know, what I'm talking about in that example. However, Uncle Sam says that person who doesn't have earned income deserves a retirement plan too. As long as they're a married couple filing a joint tax return, it doesn't matter who earned the income. As long as there's enough earned income, both can actually contribute to their own individual IRAs. In other words, each one has to set up their own IRA. If you don't have, if you don't have one set up already, so if they have one is already established, just contribute to that one that's existing. Or if they don't have an IRA, they need to establish one. Now, when we start taking a look at IRAs, one of the benefits of an IRA is that the contribution may be used as a tax deduction. Um, what does that mean? Maybe it also may not be. <laughs> Uh, what that means is that certain individuals who um, have already participated in another type of plan may be limited in their opportunity to use that contribution as a tax deduction. And that uh, factor uh, involves an employer-sponsored plan. For those individuals already covered by an employer-sponsored plan or is married to one, their income will determine whether or not their contribution to a traditional IRA is deductible. In other words, let's say you have a single, single person and they already participate in their employer's 401k plan. If they want to use their contribution as a tax deduction, their modified adjusted gross income must be below 62000 If it's between 62 and 72000 only a portion of their contribution may be used as a tax deduction. Now, if their income exceeds 72000 their contribution is not deductible at all. Now, as you can see, under 62, you can still participate in an employer-sponsored plan and fully deduct your IRA contribution. If it's between 62 and 72,000, it's partially deductible. Over 72, no deduction at all. Again, the definition of income is called the modified adjusted gross income. This is where I would refer you to your tax advisor to determine what your modified adjusted gross income would be. It's your income adjusted, in other words, reduced already, but certain um, deductions need to be added back in and that goes beyond the scope of the seminar. That's why I say go talk to your competent tax advisor. Now, in, in this concept, you might be saying, well, what happens between 62 and 72? Now, this is what happens. Let's say the individual is under age 50, uh, which their maximum annual contribution would be 5,500. If, if the single, single individual has a modified adjusted gross income of, let's say, 67,000, where does 67,000 fall in relation to 62 to 72? Well, halfway. That tells us that halfway or 50% of the annual contribution is the only amount that they can put into an IRA and use it as a tax deduction. Out of the 5,500, one half of that, if they contributed, will be deductible. Well, what would be the best place to put the other half? Well, they might want to consider another IRA called the Roth IRA, which we'll talk about in a second. As you can see, again, depending upon the modified adjusted gross income of the individual who's covered by an employer-sponsored plan, will determine whether or not their contribution is deductible or not. Now, let's take a look at a Roth IRA. Who's eligible to contribute to a Roth? There is no age limit. Guess how old Senator Roth was when he created the Roth legislation before he passed away, of course. Well, Senator Roth is around 82 years old. There are individuals out there that are working beyond 17 and a half. Now, a tax deduction is no longer a, a, a benefit for these individuals because Roth contributions – are not tax deductible. Therefore, the contribution is includable uh, in their tax return. In other words, the earned income that they earn will be taxable when they contribute that to a Roth. Contributions to a Roth can also be distributed at any time because it's already been taxed. No age limit. Earned income is required to contribute to a Roth. However, unlike a traditional, there are income limits to determine whether or not an individual is eligible to contribute to a Roth. Again, spousal contributions are also available for the Roth, as long as the married couple uh, files a joint tax return. Now, here are the income limits for Roths. For single individuals, uh, 118 to 133, under 118, you're eligible to contribute a full Roth a statutory amount, as long as you have enough earned income. Between 118 to 133, you're going to put a partial. Over 133, you're not eligible for a Roth at all. For a married filing joint tax return for 2017 under 186, you can still make a Roth contribution. 186 to 196, a partial Roth over 196, not eligible for Roth. For a married couple filing a separate return, 
given the fact that the married couple is already receiving a tax benefit by filing a separate return, the income limit is dramatically lower. It's zero to 10,000. Again, check with your tax advisor. The maximum contribution for both a traditional and Roth IRA, in other words, the limit is shared by both a traditional and a Roth. You cannot put 5,500 to a traditional and 5,500 to a Roth. It's shared by both. You can put any variation of contributions to both a traditional and a Roth as, the com- as long as the combined total of whatever you contributed to both types of IRAs does not exceed this one limit. It's 5,500 for people who are under the age of 50 for th- 2017 and 5,500 for 2018. Chop-chop contributions, again, is an additional 1,000 uh, for both years because there, there is no cost of living adjustments. So in other words, you will never see that go up. So the total contribution for 2017 is 6,500 for people age 50 and over and 6,500 for 2018. Now, the de- deadline again is the tax return due date of an individual not including extensions. Uh, we talked about the tax benefits of each type of IRA. Moving right along, how do you get started with setting up an, an IRA? Well, you open up an account at Entrust or any financial institution, but in this case, we prefer you open up with Entrust. Fund, fund your account via an annual contribution, or you now that you know about transfers and rollovers, you can transfer money from another financial institution to the Entrust Group, or uh, if you t- took a distribution for another institution, as long as it's done within 60 days, you can roll it over. And voila, you've got an IRA at the interest group that's fully funded, ready for you to invest in the open ocean of investments out there, of course, uh, assuming that it's allowable under law. And then last but not least, uh, you direct us to invest in a particular investment as, or direct us as your, your IRA administrator to purchase whatever asset you want with your retirement plan dollars that you have uh, uh, transferred or rolled over into the interest group. Set up an account online. Setting up an account online is easy. It's 10 minutes. You can go to www.theentrustgroup.com. And in this case, we have a promo. The promo uh, that we have is uh, we will waive the $50 set of fees if it's established by, before the tax, on or before the tax return due date, which is April 17th. The use of the promo tax code is promo tax 18. And that will waive that $50 setup fee to set up an account at the entrance.